Okay, um, thank you for coming. This is the last week of, um, of term. I understand that the students uh, cannot make it because they have to uh, take their exams. Uh, but uh, you are the lucky ones because we left uh, the best for last. Uh, and also afterwards, you are also invited to a pizza uh, outside in the garden after we speak about uh, Turkey. Uh, and uh, uh, Turkey is a very big um, uh, theme for all of us. Uh, we are uh, really anxious to hear your views. Um, uh, and uh, let me very briefly present uh, the speakers. Uh, you already know them probably, most of you. But um, on the screen, we've got um, Mehmet Karvi, uh, who is uh, a lawyer, he does international law, he's also involved in Turkish politics, he done his degree here in Oxford, and he's worked for, with CSERX for uh, many, many years, along with all the other credentials uh, of Mehmet Kalle. Um, then we've got um, uh, Dimitar Becher, uh, who is uh, a lecturer with Oscar. Uh, he's uh, written his book, uh, Turkey and Erdogan, it's been translated into many languages. So he knows a thing or two about uh, Turkey as well. Uh, and uh, uh, he will be uh, talking to us uh, about his perspective of the elections. And um, last but not least, uh, Kara Vakira Koyunu, or Kara, a very good friend. He's worked with CSOX uh, in the past. Uh, he is currently at SOAS. Uh, he is a lecturer there of uh, politics and international relations. He also has a comparative perspective of Turkey, having done work on the uh, uh, Brazil and uh, Turkey, or uh, uh, Turkey and Indonesia, uh, and uh, he uh, has also done work for CSOX on Turkey's foreign policy. Uh, as he uh, Basaran has not been able to, um, uh, to be with us uh, today, um, uh, but she will be giving a talk uh, in the autumn because she just finished her uh, PhD uh, on um, uh, Turkey in the Middle East. Um, but um, let's start straight away, and we will go on Orthodox. We will start with Mehmet from the um, uh, online. Uh, uh, okay, Mehmet? If you say so. <laughs> that I can... Okay, I let's just say, Mehmet, before we start, yes, I should have given some instructions. I think that you should give your take of the elections, you know, for 10, 12 minutes, uh, each one of you from the perspective that you want to um, approach it. I mean, there are so many questions on the political, economic, foreign, or foreign policy field, uh, whatever you say is going to be particularly significant. So why don't you have 20 minutes maximum with your take of uh, the election to give you, and then we will go with a, a debate and questions, OK? That sounds good. That sounds good. I will share my screen. I've got, do you see my screen right now? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, I, I will try to focus on the opposition and the opposition in these elections, and I'll try to wrap it up in twelve minutes. And first, of course, what happened? What happened is that yes, Erdogan has won the elections again with fifty-two percent against forty-eight percent of Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu on the screen. You can see actually the evaluation, the evol evolution of votes for the opposition and for Erdogan since 2014, frankly, you know, just what you can see there is that not much has changed. I mean, the uh, it's that balance of 51.5% against 48.5% or 52 to 48 has remained more or less constant over time. And the opposition has managed to get 48% in this election as well. One might say, okay, nothing, not much has changed. But on the other hand, perhaps, you know, just one minor uh, claim to success that the opposition could have is that before in the previous elections that 48 percent has never been consolidated on one one single name but here in these elections it has been consolidated in the vote of one single candidate however this cannot certainly be put forward as a success for the opposition because what we have here it sounds like a defeat smells like a defeat feels like a defeat and it is certainly seen as uh, as a historic defeat, if I do not exaggerate, you know, just for most backers of the opposition, because as we all know, you know, just despite all quote unquote favorable conditions for the opposition, an economic, you know, just downturn in the country, it, it being immediate in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, despite all those conditions, the opposition has not managed to win yet another election. Of course, I mean, one might, you know, just one should ask, you know, just why this has happened. One can, um, of course, I mean, we have to underline another part, you know, just another important, I'm sorry, before I move on to why 
we have to underline another important thing here, you know, just that, especially for the main opposition, uh, I believe is an important part of the story. And this is the number of the MPs that they managed to get out of these elections. And here you can see the evolution of the voting share of the main political parties in Turkey. AKP has scored actually one of its worst results. That's something that is worth underlining. They have scored around 35%. I mean, this is one of the worst results for AKP. CHP has scored its very traditional to about 5%, but on the one hand, it is its very traditional voting share, but on the other hand, uh, four political parties that form part of the table of six, they entered into this election under the umbrella of the CHP. Therefore, this 25% does not only reflect CHP, but CHP's vote, it just reflects the votes of those other four political parties as well. And because of this, while CHP had 146 MPs in the previous parliament, they ended up with 130 MPs in these elections. And actually, they have won 169, but 39 MPs are, you know, just for the other political parties that form part of the alliance. They have already resigned for the CHP and CHP ended up with its almost lowest share, lowest number of the MPs. And that is certainly one of the main reasons why supporters of the CHP has has or support the view that this is a historic defeat. Why? I mean, I will count, you know, just six reasons, I believe, you know, just that are the uh, important, most important drivers of this failure on the part of the opposition. The first one is, I mean, it's it's in no particular order. I wouldn't say that it was, it's in the, you know, just order of priority or importance. But the first one, of course, is the name of the candidate. I mean, what we see now with the benefit of hindsight is that Perhaps Mr. Kilisharola was not the right candidate. Why do we do why do we say that? Not because of his identity, whether he was charismatic or not, this and that. These are all the factors, of course, that may have played a role, but that, that these are factors that are difficult to assess or measure. But what we know is that as CHP has insisted on his name, this has caused problem with the second largest political party within the alliance, which is E party. And what we can see by making certain statistical comparisons is that not all those who voted for E party did actually vote for Kalishtarol. Had the had the you know just opposition alliance you know, just been able to you know gather around a consensus name like Imamolu, in that case, most probably the picture could have been different. That's one of the you know, just main reasons. But I believe you know just another very important reason is. Uh, re relates to the strategy of the alliances. The opposition has adopted a so-called, in my view, a unitary alliance strategy. A unitary alliance in the sense that they put for forward one single name, not, you know, just, they did not put forward separate names during the first round. They put forward one single name, Mr. Kalishtarolu, and the opposition parties, the four minor players of the opposition alliance, they entered into the parliamentary elections under the umbrella of the CHP. And not only that, although not formally a part of the alliance, the Kurdish political party, they did not put forward a presidential candidate. I mean, back then, of course, the understanding one was that, yes, if we do that, you know, there will be a stronger force uh, against Erdogan. But it turned out to be the wrong strategy because perhaps following a confederal alliance or a federal alliance strategy could have worked better. Here, I mean, I'm explaining, I'm trying to explain why, as you can see, although four po smaller political parties of the alliance, they entered into this election together with the CHP. As you can see here, CHP's voting share hasn't changed. CHP's voting share has remained around 25%. But what happened is, I mean, here you can see the just voting shares of different political parties that form different alliances. I mean, Yenidan Refah Party, see, it, which is a, you know, one of the, you know, just successor parties to the Felicity Party. It is one of those very traditional Islamist parties in Turkey. They scored almost 3%. This was not expected at all. What happened, what we can read here is that most of the conservative, really conservative, traditional Islamists who could have voted for one of those four smaller political parties that are the post AKP, you know, just conservative parties, one can name them. They decided not to vote for the opposition, most probably because they were running under the CHP banner. That means this unitary alliance strategy harmed those political parties and their voting share 
has been transferred or has gone on with other parties under the government's alliance. That's one thing. And the second important you know, just consequence of this has been that the loyal basis, the membership basis of those four political parties plus CHP's organizational base, they have lost a great deal of their motivation for the elections as well, because in order to create room for the candidates from those smaller parties, CHP has given up quite some important spaces. This has been controversial and this has certainly affected the motivation of their loyal bases. And another important issue that we have to underline here is as the Kurdish political party or the, you know, the leftist alliance, as it were, did not put forward its own candidate, here you can see that their voting share has actually gone down to 9.2%. This is the lowest votes this is the low, lowest voting share for the Kurdish political party over a long period of time. Of course, this could be well because they did not put forward a their own candidate, but also we cannot forget the immense amount of pressure that has been put upon them by the governmental forces and the fact that most of their leaders are currently in prison. I mean, this, this was the second reason. And I believe, you know, just the third reason that we have to uh, we have to underline here is that the opposition has in one way or another underestimated the power of government propaganda, the power of government communications. The government has adopted a very nationalistic, actually even militaristic uh, campaign language. They have used even fake videos accusing the opposition alliance to ally up with the PKK, with the terrorist organization. And the opposition, as part of its campaign, has chosen before the first round not to respond back to this. It has started responding back to that only after the first round before the runoff, but it was what we understand is quite late to do that. But of course, a corollary of this is that the opposition, despite all their previous experience, has still continued to rely on media, mainstream media. But the fact of the matter is, yes, the mainstream media is largely controlled by the government and the opposition has not drawn, had not drawn the right lesson from the previous failures that it had to, in order to succeed, it had to develop its own channels of one-to-one -one, face to face communication with the waters it cannot rely on, or it should not have relied on mainstream media. And more Similarly, I believe another important part of the picture, and that's the fourth reason I believe uh, that would explain the failure of the opposition, the opposition overestimated the economic crisis in the country. Yes, there is an economic crisis in the country. Yes, there is an economic downturn in Turkey, but this has not reached the level where people change their traditional political uh, allegiances. And I believe, you know, just the graph that explains that is the one on the screen. Uh, this is a, the, this is a chart that I have taken just from another article. It is in Turkish and the title is additional employment, additional jobs. Basically, this is the rate of job creation or the amount of job creation of the Turkish economy. Here, as you can see, immediately before the 2019 2019 municipal electoral victory of the opposition uh, opposition parties the economy in turkey had been losing jobs that is to say the un unemployment has been going up however the governing coalition the government has drawn the right lesson has adopted a very heterodox policy uh, at very heterodox economic policy that pushed the limits of turkish economy to the limits but by doing that they managed to maintain a positive employment creation rate, they did not, you know, just they, they made sure that there was no increase in the unemployment. And that basically created the ground for them to be able to preserve their vote. And this is yet another chart that would explain that. That's the consumer's confidence index. And here, as you can see, with, that, with their adoption of that heterodox strategy, the consumer confidence has first started going down because that's the period of really very high inflation. But from the beginning of this year onwards, with because of the basis effect, that we can see that the consumers started thinking that the worst had already been 
gone through and therefore the confidence of the consumers started going up as well and the opposition has failed to read this and has based all the strategy upon the understanding that the economic crisis is so deep it has already reached that level that it could change everything and the fifth reason I will I'll touch upon that very briefly: the opposition has underestimated the socio-political power of the of the governing coalition and of the AKP. The simple fact is that AKP has twelve million members, and AKP controls quite a, quite a lot of foundations, quite a lot of associations. Those institutions they create jobs, they create environments of socialization. And they create really tightly knit communities and the opposition are just sort of underestimated the power of the space. And the sixth and the last one in my analysis uh, as the reason of the opposition failure is that, yes, the opposition has put forward a, you know, just an understanding, a vision for a new Turkey, but it, they lacked a comprehensive and inspiring vision for the future. I mean, the vision that they could put forward was that, okay, we will not be like Erdogan. Yes, we will go back to the parliamentary democracy. We will respect rule of law more. We will adopt more traditional, more orthodox economic policies. But they did not come up, you know, just with an inspiring vision for the future around which they could create a new politicization. I mean, Ayşe Kadolu, a great, you know, just friend, colleague of ours and a great friend of CSOC's, she wrote an article two months ago, actually, before the elections, where she actually underlined that, you know, just when we examine the stories of success against authoritarian governments, not only, you know, just forming a coalition is important, but putting forward an inspiring vision for the future is also important, but the opposition has unfortunately failed to do that. Uh, I can see that I've already used my 12 minutes. I'm going to stop here, but, you know, just in the discussion part, I will also touch upon, you know, what could be COVID is for opposition? What could be you know, just the future for opposition? That's something I believe I can come back to in the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Mehmet. You set the scene very nicely for the um, uh, subsequent discussion and it's good that you gave us the perspective from the opposition and why this uh, failed to win the election. Uh, let's go to Clara now. Uh, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, thank you very much. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here, um, although uh, the topics of our uh, conversations are less and less pleasing. Uh, and, and when I look back to my first engagement with Sea Talks and you know the height of optimism and energy, and now you know the trajectory over the past decade, nonetheless, it's still a good place to come together and uh, take stock of uh, where we are. Uh, I think you know uh, uh, Mehmet has covered uh, uh, you know. Uh, great ground in terms of explaining um, from the opposition side uh, what went wrong. And, and I, I, I do agree with him that uh, um, a lot has to be said and thought about in terms of what the opposition could have done differently. I sometimes come across analyses uh, that uh, and, and, and opinions of uh, more casual Turkey watchers who are nonetheless aware of where things have been lately and, and people who say that, well, we knew that Erdogan was going to win. In fact, this wasn't uh, the case. This shouldn't be taken for granted. Uh, real politics has happened. And um, I, I think ultimately, unfortunately, opposition uh, managed to um, clinch defeat from the jaws of victory. Uh, and this is, I think, very important. Also, they are demoralized. Um, so we, we really should focus on the opposition and what oppositions in similar autocratizing environments should and could do better. Uh, I think. However, moving forward, there are two questions that uh, the elections pose. One is how did we get here, or rather, how, in, how the, despite two decades in power and economic crisis and uh, major earthquake, everyone still managed to come away with a victory um, in these elections against increasing expectations of a change, um, or we could put it the flip side why he is still only managing to get 52% and not more. So I think that's also an interesting question. Why is he not managing to get 60% despite or above, despite having um, the state apparatus in his in his control? What is different uh, with Turkey then compared to say Russia, for instance? And the second question is what now? 
So what are, what are we looking at now? Um, I'll very briefly share with you a few bullet points and we can pick up on them. Um, in terms of the how question, um, I'll pick up on it also what Mehmet has brought up, uh, this idea that this observation that the last four elections have been pretty much the same result, even though coalitions have shifted with a 52 to 48 story. And I think this is an interesting story. For the last decade, Erdogan has managed to gather 52% of the vote. It's not 58, it's not 68, but it's enough to rule as if he got 100% of the vote. It doesn't matter if it's 50% plus one for his majoritarian viewpoint, that's enough to claim legitimacy uh, to rule on behalf of the people. Um, explaining this long-term relative success, relative success, I think there are three plus one reasons, three reasons that have to do with the government and Erdogan and one outside of his, uh, in terms of domestic politics, outside of his um, immediate control. The three underlying reasons for Erdogan's success domestically is one, um, he has managed to cement uh, polarization in a way that just makes his victory uh, not inevitable, but um, very difficult to, 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 his situation very difficult to undermine. Um, I call this the great Erdogan firewall. It has been incredibly difficult for the opposition to break that firewall um, and reach the base which Erdogan and his coalition partners have managed to hold together. What we see is uh, in these elections is that um, voters who are uh, uh, this, unsatisfied with the ruling party move within one block from one party to another party, but do not cross over to the opposition block. Same with the opposition, actually. We have voters who are unhappy with the CHP. Maybe they move to the workers' parties and vice versa, but, uh, but there's very little movement across the blocks. And the blocks are, even though they look very even, they're not actually, it's 52 to 48. So that gives Erdogan uh, this advantage. And how did he do this? Well, media control obviously has a lot to do with it. 90% of the national media being in Erdogan's uh, pro-government control, and it's basically disseminating 24-7 propaganda through uh, news channels, talk shows, but also, also uh, uh, TV shows. There's a new TV show that's about the air on TRT, the Turkish public broadcaster, called Metamorphosis. And, and, and lo and behold, it's um, about Osman Kavala and how he turns from this uh, civil society actor into, into this sinister agent of foreign uh, power. So whatever um, agenda the government wants to push, they do not just do it through um, news channels or, or, uh, or campaign propaganda, but in, in these manners which the opposition has no means of uh, competing. Um, and also exploiting identity politics in the most uh, perhaps shameless, unabashed way, um, which uh, the opposition has not done to that extent. That's number one. Number two is eliminating threats and uh, that's co-opting and, and repressing. That's a tool at the disposal of autocratic uh, leaders, co-opting especially the, the right wing whenever there's an alternative coming from the right, uh, um, bringing that into the governing poll. Erdogan has successfully done that or marginalizing the right wing candidate uh, alternatives and repressing the left and the Kurds. And I think there are two names here that uh, Erdogan has shown us he takes seriously as a potential threat of upsetting the balance. Um, those are Selahattin Demirtas and Ekrem Imamoglu. And he has put Demirtas in prison with no expectation of coming out now. Um, and uh, Imamoglu will be uh, probably banned from, if there's a new court case that's open on top of the one that existed, he would probably be banned from politics soon and removed from his mayorship. So the use of the judiciary, politicized judiciary. And the third one is institutionalizing the party state. And that goes back to what Mehmet was saying, um, and which also helps explain the polarization aspect. There's a very blurred line over, you know, after two decades of AKP rule between the party and the state. The party is the bridge between um, the voters, uh, AKP coalition allies, um, Erdogan's clients, and the state apparatus, the bureaucracy. Um, 
And Erdogan plays a very strategic role in this. Perhaps his most important role is that of overseeing and distributing resources and rent to these diverse networks of allies, uh, um, clients, and supporters. Um, and, and that, again, brings me to what Mehmet was saying about basically having 12 million people membership base. And that needs to be emphasized because if you have a family with a member and every within every family, two people vote for the AKP, that makes uh, over 20, 24 million votes. And that's already 35%, you know, almost guaranteed vote for the AKP. Um, every other party's membership base put together uh, is less than one third of the AKP's uh, of membership base. So um, when you think about from that perspective, for a um, lower middle class voter in a uh, provincial Anatolian town, who has access to state resources through the party, maybe gain a position within the party organization and gain prestige, most importantly, how would they see the prospect of uh, the Erdogan government falling? Would economic problems deter them from voting for Erdogan and his party or actually push, push them even closer to the party because the collapse of that entire institution would put them in peril? So I think this is something the opposition has um, very much underestimated. See. So, um, so these are, I think, the and, and the three plus one, uh, the plus one is the opposition's own um, faults, which Mehmet has um, uh, explained, and we should really talk more about. When you combine these the, 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 these factors, the fact that the opposition has not learned the lesson, has only selected its candidates less than two months or two months to this historic election through a very uh, conflicted uh, process did not uh, only rely on campaign process rather than groundworking, groundwork networking, which should have been happening for years. Um, it tells us that you know, this is not how to how, how you defeat an autocratizing leader who's been uh, a master at winning elections. So just for the last few minutes, um, let me move on to the question of what now? Um, where we are standing, I don't. I think you know maybe it's still the post-election hangover, but I think this is going to be a long hangover. Um, it will be difficult to get ourselves up, uh, and I don't. I think the the so the silver linings are very very thin. Unfortunately, this is the this this is one of my sort of. I realize this is less of a feeling than than a fact, and. Um, what the first implication of uh, the, the the election outcome is the entrenchment of strongman politics, hyper presidentialized uh, uh, strongman politics, and and the party state in Turkey, um, which means that even if Erdogan uh, were to uh, disappear, uh, you know, for health reasons or, or or step down, and and if he's defeated, and there's an alternative, you know, opposition uh, victory in five year time, which I don't see happening. The presidentialized uh, uh, nature of Turkish politics will persist. Nobody will have a clear incentive to actually go back to parliamentary politics. I think presidentialism, ex hyper executive presidentialism, is for for you know, it's, it's here to stay for the foreseeable future, and that will of course you know, generate new sources of uh, strongman populist politics. Uh, that will be Erdogan's legacy. Um, I think the opposition will be in this array for the foreseeable future as well. And this is layer upon layer. First, we have already this um, struggles happening within the CHP. Then we'll experience, we'll, we'll witness um, potential separation between the two main opposition partners, the nationalist EE and CHP. Um, and I think one of the biggest questions is whether the Kurds Will, act, will will continue supporting this opposition alliance, which hasn't really served them well. It has actually, uh, you know, they've been supporting it since 2015, um, this rainbow coalition, democratizing coalition, but they've been more and more isolated, more and more beaten down. Uh, and with Selahattin Demirtas now declaring that he's stepping back from active politics, the voice of those who are, um, who have been advocating Moving away from this losing alliance and, and, and pursuing a more standalone nationalist path, which could open the way also for negotiating with Erdogan, 
will be it will be at least much stronger votes. And if the Kurds don't support whoever the opposition candidate is in the municipal elections next year, um, the opposition will have a difficult time holding on to Ankara and Istanbul. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think I've already just okay two more minutes um, to finish up with my little less maybe um, what now question. With the opposition in disarray, and if you see this entrenchment of uh, personalized uh, politics, um, Erdogan is his own, he's competing with himself and with his own health. And that puts the question of succession to the top of the political agenda. Um, so whether it's this term or next term, this will come up and become a bigger issue. At the moment, he hasn't groomed the candidate as successor, uh, partly, partly because of his own failure to tolerate independent-minded uh, up-and-coming politicians, but three names are uh, important to watch. Um, Hakan Fidan, the new uh, foreign minister, former head of intelligence, Ibrahim Kalin, who's now heading the uh, intelligence agency, and the longer shot Sajid Bayraktar, the engineer behind uh, the um, famous Turkish drones. And um, and I think, yeah, well, let, let me stop there, actually. I have, maybe we can come back to the economy and the uh, ideology and the uh, Thank you very much, Carla. Indeed, we'll be coming to those issues, and uh, there are questions that are generated by your talk as well that we can address uh, later. Let's uh, move to Dimitra. Hopefully, Dimitra, you can talk a bit on foreign policy as well. Yeah, that was my initial brief, but I could not resist the temptation to uh, come back to some of the points Absolutely. that Kara and, and Mehmet raised yeah. at the risk of uh, sounding like the one bringing calls to Newcastle or whatever the Turkish equivalent. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it's easy, easy in hindsight to say what went wrong, but let me give my three factors as well uh, for, the, for the sake of the, the exercise. One is obviously personalities. Erdogan is a very skillful politician. Despite um, suffficient that he is not being formed anymore, that he's having health, health problems, that he's not as charismatic, he's running out of energy. That's not the case. He connects to the electorate. And, and he he's a campaigner. He's somebody who rose to the top of politics, not because, as in Russia, somebody appointed him uh, uh, from uh, behind the scenes, but he worked his way from the street uh, to the pinnacle of power. And he survived many a an ordeal, not least in the short time. So I have to give it to him. And conversely, to um, he, he has his appeal. His uh, selling point was uh, look, I'm not. Ambitious, I don't want to be a president for life. My task is to be this transitional figure, a bit like Joe Biden, but he ran for president to um, mend the things and to pass it on to a successor. But he, he is a liability because he comes from a minority background. Um, he uh, is associated with the secularists. He's uh, vulnerable to dog whistle politics, that he's not a real Turk, uh, I mean, from the Alibi community and maybe the Kurdish heritage. He's somebody who lost many elections, but there's no accountability in the party. So there's no, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a consistent problem with Turkish politics, although it doesn't happen at the national level, it happens at party level. So he, he was not the strongest uh, to run, despite the arguments he put forward uh, for himself. Secondly, something that both uh, Mehmet and Kara uh, hinted at the system is uh, rigged in a way that. Um, the house always wins. And in the house uh, means the presidential palace in Peshtepe in Ankara. So those of you who had a pleasure to have been there, uh, it's very difficult to, to win such a contest. And you face perverse incentives, you have to contest. But the likelihood of you losing as an opposition and legitimating the vote are very high as well. And then Erdogan obviously has the media on his side, he can model. The, the narrative, a bit like Orban. Um, if you can quantify looking at how many minutes each hand has got on the public broadcaster. Uh, the opposition is cornered in some parts of the media, but their message doesn't go all the way to the swing voters they want to reach out to. And secondly, uh, being part of the system, and um, it's party state, or maybe two party state, given that the National Action Party is uh, also in the coalition, has access to uh, resources. Um, Erdogan re-ramped up the welfare offering in, in a difficult economic period. He promised 
um, uh, uh, very generous uh, old building, um, probably 500,000 new, new homes backed by preparation loans. Uh, he uh, and it's the government, but obviously he gets the credit for uh, hiking up salaries in the public sector, pensions as well. And I'm sure in places hit by the earthquake, that was something nobody expected. Um, for other the reason people voted in mass for the AKP in Karaman Maraj, right to center, 56% AKP, is that at the local level, those associations are basically telling uh, voters, um, you might be unhappy about the way you handled the earthquake. Okay, we give it, uh, we give you that, it was a disaster, but think rationally, who is likely to rebuild your home in a year's time? Is it us? And you know us, we've been in power for 20 years. Or is it this ramshackle coalition who, uh, I mean, they represent all kinds of forces. Can you entrust your life? And it's rational for you. And that's why probably, uh, and I don't have the evidence of this, because that's why you have this problem with force. Um, the problem with the shaykh conservative. People couldn't um, admit to uh, forces that they'll be voting as well, because it's not a prestige vote anymore. He carries liability. But they'll stick with the devil they know. Um, partly because of tribal politics, conservatism, partly because of the media environment, but also partly because of the clientelistic logic uh, behind it all. So being part of the system gives you the incumbency advantage, and it's very difficult to do that. The final factor I want to highlight, and maybe it would work with us a bit more, uh, is alignments in society. And I think it's probably uh, sort of touched upon it. The fact is that if you have conservative base and then you have nationalism, this is a natural combination. Of course, in the good days, Islamists were seen as this uh, democratizing force. But uh, at the level of ideology, those two strands of Turkish political life make a perfect match, which is not the case on the other side. You put together a coalition, uh, you have to combine the whole spectrum from the hardcore secularists in the JHP, more democratic elements, the Kurds, those defectors from the AKP, and anybody in between. And that's a difficult act to sustain because uh, irrespective of what you choose as a candidate or as a strategy, you're bound to um, alienate someone. If you give too much to the Kurds, there'll be national defectors uh, who go to, to Erdogan or to this other nationalist force that emerged with Um, If you go into the nationalist direction, which happened in the second round with Kurdish Darunu, saying, I'll um, make sure that all the Syrians leave tomorrow, all four million of them. Um, of course, Kurds won't take it uh, that lightly and um, turn out to be depressed in the Southeast uh, regions. So the conservative nationalist alliance is much more cohesive and homogenous, if you will. Uh, and that's not the case uh, uh, on the opposition side. And all, the other depressing corollary is that um, whatever happens, nationalism always wins because you have nationalists on all sides and nationalism has become the hegemonic force. To the extent that people are joking in Turkey that, and well, it's probably, a, it wasn't you saying it, Tara, that he's uh, the nationalist action party, best project ever. Mm. He's the hardware in there, the software, the, uh, became a bit like Blair to Bush or the, the, the idea that you were speaking, giving ideas to, to the powers uh, that they is patch, patching to Blair. Greeks to the Romans and whatever other uh, uh, analogs you can think of. Uh, so that's depressing. It's, it's likely to stay off, uh, irrespective of whether Erdogan stays or leaves or whoever gets to run back with this legacy, uh, this uh, mixture. Uh, that is right now uh, hegemonic in, in Turkish uh, public life uh, is not going away. Now, I'll say a few words about what comes next. You know, I'll say a few words about the relationship with the external world. Um, so the economy, um, yeah, there's some positive noises now. And then Shimshek is back in power now. Everyone is saying that uh, he'll give Shimshek some space to set uh, policy, uh, the appointment of the new uh, governor of the central bank, somebody incidentally linked to the first, not the uh, of the bank in the US, the first republic that went bust, but irrespective, 
uh, they're signaling a return to more conventional uh, policies with uh, interest rate. It's not that easy to transition from negative interest rates to uh, to uh, high uh, interest rate because it involves a lot of adjustments. But I think it will be a positive signal to to investors in the short term. I'm doubtful as to how sustainable it is because well, there might come a day when Erdogan falls into these old sort of thing. He fires the chip check. We've seen that before, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Election comes here. Exactly. And, and the economy is, is uh, likely to remain the active skill. Um, the AKP came to the conclusion that they can muddle through whatever comes. They've seen a few crises since 2018. But who knows? They might be the mother of all crises around the corner. And Turkey is vulnerable to the external environment. Uh, it's not like other authoritarian countries that have their indigenous energy resources or rents to be generated from within it. It actually depends on uh, uh, financial uh, inflows from outside in, in various forms. And there's as much money in the Saudis and the Qataris uh, and the Emiratis can invest to prop up the Mira. Um, so that's, that's something to, to watch uh, there, definitely. I think the issue of succession is absolutely central. So we might like we might see the Turkish version of the HBO series uh, in in the next five to ten years with Erdogan trying to pass the baton. I think Bayraktar Seljuk uh, has a, a fair chance because his family can trust the guy. He's capable as well, unlike his uh, the other uh, son in law who was a spectacular failure. Um, uh, with Al Bayrak. Uh, Bayraktar seems competent. He is educated at MIT, uh, people who know them uh, think highly of him. But there's no linearity in passing the, the baton and, and those authoritarian regimes, which are personalistic. It's difficult, it's difficult to fill the shoes very well, to uh, take over the party, to connect to people at the local level, to win elections. So I, I, I don't think it will be a smooth affair if he goes uh, that route. Um, and they, they, they have problems. And the yeah. problem is that, again, in personalistic regimes, the cost of being in power is to actually hold out the institutions. In other places like Algeria, you, you take away the figureheads and then the regime reproduces itself. But if Erdogan is gone, there will be stability and I think it can, can really unravel. And the post Erdogan situation might be reminiscent of Spain in 1975. Well, you know, during 2019, I think. Uh, on presidentialism, yes, it might be entrenched, but uh, let's be a bit more open minded there because there is a scenario where one says, you know what, I want to continue because I'm irreplaceable. The only way around it is to actually return the parliamentary system. If you want the parliamentary system in your opposition, that's fine. We can bring it back, it's popular with the people, but guess who will be the prime minister? And, and there won't be a, a parliamentary limit. So what I want to say is not that this is a given, but that he has some institutional tricks up his sleeve uh, to prolong this rule. So we don't know how it will play out, but it will be something that is really hanging over uh, this regime. The dependence on this one individual, uh, ever skillful that uh, he is, and it will, it will be difficult to have another Erdogan down the line because this is the nature of, of the game. Now let's say a few words before I wrap up uh, on foreign policy. Uh, and I'll start with the Russia Ukraine war, obviously. I see more of the same view. Um, I don't see anything changing. Uh, Turkey is in a very comfortable place because early in the war, it could have gone in a very uh, bad direction for Turkey. Think about the scenario where Russia was able to occupy the whole of the Mexican Middle getting off Ukraine from the Black Sea. So the Ukrainians have done the job for Turkey to stop Russia, to balance Russia. And now Erdogan is playing both, both sides and he'll continue to do so. And by the way, I don't think the opposition would have done anything different. Um, NATO is as essential for the Turks as before. There are theatrics around Sweden, but uh, my understanding is that eventually in some way they'll be compromised and Sweden will be part of, uh, of NATO. And Turkey will play this double game where there will be a lot of anti Western rhetoric. Uh, Erdogan will be playing this card, but NATO will remain a, a Turkish uh, insurance policy. Just a small fact to it. Now, NATO had its biggest ever air defense exercise in Germany, and Turkey was part of it. So it did, it did some of its, uh, its air force. Hungary did as well, by the way. Um, so, more of the same there. 
The Middle East by the an area where actually see some action. Uh, now the Bakush Mongol with Assad regime is in full swing. Uh, Fatan Pidan, who was mentioned, uh, is a critical fair. In fact, I, I, I think it's healthy that he is not the foreign minister. It also institutionally seems that the foreign ministry will regain some of its weight. Uh, Fakar Pidan has been the former foreign minister for a long time. He oversaw uh, the supply of weapons to Syria. He oversaw the secret talks with the PKK in Oslo. He's been in charge for a long time, and he has as well as he has. Um, having him in for, the foreign ministry uh, actually is, is an encouraging sign. And finally, since we are at the European Studies Center, um, no way around saying it was about uh, Europe. Um, the opposition, of course, make a really strong case that uh, there needs to be a reset uh, with the European Union. And had that they succeeded uh, with the presidential campaign, there would have been an opening, not necessarily uh, related to the accession talks. Uh, this is a trade that has long left, left the station. But if you had three all our friends like Osman Kabala um, and Kanaotna and the rest of those political prisoners, then I think the German government would have been much more open to the idea of to uh, expand the customs union, which is where, where the action is being based. Now, without uh, Erdogan making any moves um, and sticking to his guns, the best we can hope for is more of the, this transactional relationship. Next year, the refugee deal will be a renewal. I see interest on both sides to renew it. There'll be a peace new cooperation on energy, on green transition as well, uh, but no big project on shared vision. But equally, on the positive side, there won't be a divorce uh, either. Um, so it's not um, to say that uh, Europe is not really relevant uh, for, for therapy. And finally, um, because I think often you say give us a silver lining or something, um, things could have been much worse because all my uh, fellow analysts in the run up to this election, their top prediction beyond Kulazaru uh, making everyone uh, sweat and uh, giving him a run for his money was there'll be trouble around Greece and Cyprus in the Aegean and the Eastern Mediterranean. Nothing of that sort materialized, luckily. Uh, in, in fact, uh, the earthquake provided some space for engagement. Uh, and compared to 2017, the referendum campaign and the presidential election in 2018, Erdogan didn't use European governments as punching banks. Um, say Germany didn't allow our ministers to go campaign with those nasty Dutch. Uh, we remember ambassadors being reported, so on and so forth. Um, but the, the tones, it seems to me, is relatively positive on both sides. And if you're a bit cynical, I'm sure there are a few governments around uh, the table in, in Brussels. Um, I'm even more really happy that they have to now transact with the devil they know uh, in Ireland. So all the sales is sort of predictable. So let me stop here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I've got uh, one question for each of you, and then we can uh, open it up to more questions. <clears throat> now, my question to Mehmet, uh, because um, you spoke about the position and uh, you know the position, Mehmet, what do you expect the position to do? Uh, is this 52, 48 uh, percent, uh, the two fortresses that uh, Carla is talking about, are they impenetrable? I mean, can you see movement within them? Um, how would they react, you see, uh, you know, is it a 52, 48 as we perceive it, or is it something which is much more flexible? And do we expect the position to react in any way? Because from the discussion that we had so far, it's like the position looks at fragmented, active, and just looking at what's gonna happen, you know, while the leader continues his, uh, his authority. What do you think uh, that the position would do better? Um, it's a tough question, but, you know, just I agree with uh, Kara's uh, assessment that the opposition seems to be in disarray at this stage. And, you know, just this will continue for a while. Uh, there will be a, a leadership race, most probably, within the CHP, within the main opposition party. There, of course, I mean, there is a dilemma, I mean, for Imam Oli, for Ekrem Imam Oli himself. Uh, Imam Oli, on the one hand, yes, you know, it appears that he wants to become the leader of the CHP, but him becoming the leader of the CHP would in turn mean that he would have to give up the, you know, just municipality of Istanbul, because by law, a mayor cannot be, you know, just within the, you know, 
management within the administration of a political party. That's why you know just that's number the dilemma number one. Dilemma number two the, is the you know court case that Kara has been referring to. On the one hand, Imam Oldu seems to be the most important candidate, you know, just for the leadership, you know, for the main opposition party. But on the other hand, the democracy sword is upon his head. I mean, there is that, you know, just court case, you know, just where he has been convicted to two years. And if that court case, you know, just goes through the court of appeal and the court of cassation, he's going to be banned from the politics. And that means he can't be the leader of the opposition party, nor can he be the mayor. That's why, you know, just there is that dilemma out there. But should it mean, you know, for him, you know, just to stop doing politics? I don't think it's going to be the case. I, I believe, you know, just he will certainly continue pushing for his political future. He's going to fight for his political future. But the crucial question there is whether it is going to be through the next municipal elections in Turkey, which is going to be in, in March 2024, or, or will it be, you know, just through the leadership of the CHP? That's going to be a very tough question. But even I believe more challenging than this is that the opposition, especially in the very first place, CHP, must draw the right lesson in the sense that it's not only a leadership question. Yes, it is a leadership question to a large extent, and the leadership, the agency, personalities, as Demo has pointed out, do matter. But you know, just it requires a change at the organizational level, at the ideological level as well. Because yeah, I know CHP from inside as well, and I have been in there. I know the organization. I mean, the organization is quite resilient. We have to give it to them. I mean, that. I mean, as Kara has actually, you know, just turned the question upside down. I mean, one of the questions is that. How come they manage to score forty eight percent, or how come that opposition party manages to survive despite all these pressures? I mean, we haven't, of course, gone into the details of the unfairness of the system because, as we are at the European Studies Center, we are in a learned community, and the assumption is that everybody knows about the unfairness of the system. So, or unfairness of the system. Yes, the system is extremely unfair. There is oppression. There is pressure upon all oppositional figures, but. Even then, the opposition manages to continue its fight. I believe if the, if we are looking for if we are looking for a silver lining, regardless how slim it is, it is this because I mean, especially after elections, we started hearing a lot of casual casual observers of Turkey start making the analysis that well, it was it, it it was never possible anyway. And there is certain an orientalist tone to that. It's like in a country like Turkey, you can't have democracy anyway. What were we expecting? But you know, just my answer to that is that yes, the US had a leader like Trump for four years and almost every single democratic Democrat of American suffered a PTSD after that. This country has been just going through this Erdogan trauma for the last 22 years and we still do have 48% of the population standing up out there and campaigning against them. And that's, I believe, the silver lining. And the important point here is, regardless who becomes the leader of the CHP, that person must be able to channel that popular energy into a more long-term campaigning, not campaigning, a more long-term politicization of the society because campaigning only during the election campaign time is not enough. If we have seen one thing, I believe you know, just it must be this. Yes, campaigning only for the elections is not good enough. It must be a day in, day out organizational effort. The party must become certainly much less hierarchical and it should not be embarrassed to put forward a more perhaps left-leaning societal project. And when I say left-leaning, I mean, especially just from the economic point of view. And from that perspective, CHP, as part of Kılıçdaroğlu's strategy, has gone more and more towards the right. And in order to show that it would embarrass, it would, I'm sorry, it would, it would welcome voters from the right-wing parties, I mean, from a general approach, it's not wrong, but it should not have prevented CHP to put forward a more convincing, comprehensive economic project that is not embarrassed to say that the state should play a more active role, that should not be embarrassed 
to say that you know just there must be this stronger redistributive policies. It's not that CHP hasn't done it, but this has not been you know just the headline of its campaign. This has not been done in a comprehensive manner. Therefore, yes, right now there is this array you know just within the opposition, especially within the CHP. But one thing about CHP is that yes, it has gone through several disarrays, but it has managed to you know stand back up. I mean, the resilience is out there, that's for, that's for sure. That historical resilience is out there, but a lot will depend upon the personalities as well. And Imam Ol is going to be a key figure there. But one last thing that I would say is, before 2009 elections, municipal elections, how many of you knew Ekrem Imam Oğlu's name? Very few. I mean, I, I, even you know, just amongst the you know learned observers of Turkish politics, very few of them knew of Ekrem Imamoğlu. Imamoğlu. Therefore, CHP taps into a very large and diverse source of human resources, and it can you know just generate you know, just other leaders as well. I mean, that's certainly a possibility too. That's that's certainly a possibility that should not be discarded. Thank you, Mehmet. Um... And um, kind of what I would like to uh, what I would like to ask you is uh, uh, the following. I remember uh, looking on the day of the election. So the first speech that Erdogan uh, gave in, in Istanbul uh, in front of a crowd, and uh, the crowd was uh, shouting "Bye bye bye Kemal." Did they mean Kılıçdaroğlu or did they mean Kemal Erdogan? No, they meant Kılıçdaroğlu. Uh, well, I understand, but does it mean the end of? Uh, you know, with a feminism, uh, with a new kind of tenure. I understand the question. I still, I'm still saying they meant Kemal to the show because interestingly, well, Kemalism is this, this you know, long discussion and conversation. Um, it's also um, a, 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 an ideology or a fluid ideology that can uh, be shaped to different means and ends. And we've seen this over the decades within within the Republican People's Party, within the Turkish state, you know, left-wing and right-wing iterations of Kemalism. And uh, and this is not a time when Atatürk's name, legacy, is, you know, looking like it's going to disappear. In an interesting way, Atatürk, Mustafa Kemal, is more popular and more respected than ever, and make what you will of it, um, you know, because it, it, is, it is strange, in a sense, you know, a, a decade ago, Erdogan was attacking Mustafa mm -hmm. um, or Ismail Inan, saying the two drunkards. He's not doing that anymore. Um, I was looking at AKP's election um, uh, uh, pamphlets, uh, election uh, programs from 2002 until uh, this last election, and I actually counted the time they used um, <laughs> Atatürk or Ghazi Mustafa Kemal. And, and and I was just out of curiosity. And it, the trend is very interesting. In the early days, in 2002, no mention. First of all, traditionally, Atatürk is not the way conservative or political Islam is referred to Mustafa Kemal because that's the secular Kemalist way of referring to him. He's Gazi, the more religious name for Mustafa Kemal. Uh, but there's no mention of him in 2002. In 2007, when uh, AKP is facing uh, the threat of military intervention, and there's an early election. There are two mentions of his name. Then again, 2011 and 2015, no mentions. Um, I don't remember 2018, but this year, four very distinct mentions of Ghazi Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. We are on the path of Ghazi Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. So, in a sense, he, AKP has even appropriated, or is trying to appropriate, um, Maybe Gazi, Gazi is the honorific title of given to a religious warrior who is doing jihad, but has been secularized over the past century uh, in its meaning yeah. and it's become nationalized. But of course, the use of it on, in the conservative Islamist yeah. section is still with the religious right. undertone. So, but it's it's used both by both yeah. sides of the divide. But um, to to make sense of it a little bit. We should also take into consideration that in the government fold now there are um, those uh, mm -hmm. figures who would be considered just a few years ago the most fanatical radicalists. Um, Kimchi Rizolo, yeah. um, 
you in Tamil Mehmet, uh, some of the other names, um, Metin Feizolo, these, these ultra nationalists or, or Ulus Al Jalal who have jumped ship to uh, Erdogan's side opportunistically, perhaps, but also with the case, making the case that it is now him, Erdogan, who is really fighting the PKK, who is really fighting the Gulenists, and he is the one who's actually standing up for uh, Turkey's uh, you know, uh, national interest. It's not for nothing that um, Bu Perinçek, the yeah. sort of um, Labour Party, the, the far right fascists, but also at the same time, uh, far left, <laughs> um, sort of flag bearer of the Turkish deep state, let me say, uh, who is who has been backing the Erdogan government, has called Erdogan and Islamic Kemal's. So in that sense, it's um, it's it's, it's, it's yeah, an interesting sort of uh, you know uh, evolution. There are two two aspects of that presidency. Just to simplify, one is he is the guy who won the war against the West, right? He he preserved Turkey in the system of foreign occupation and aggression, and he's also the the person who reformed Turkey later on. And you can selectively pick the first one and de-emphasize the second one to block the Arabic script and it's an unsecurized Turkey. So the Gazi part, and, and he did appeal to Muslim solidarity at the time, but it's not uh, without any uh, content. The point is now he's gone beyond just yeah. uh, the, the, the Muslim. And then just uh, very quickly, and let's also not forget that over the last years, the government also had uh, in its midst the um, nationalist uh, generals and admirals, yeah. uh, the proponents of, uh, uh, of uh, the Blue Homeland uh, doctrine, who do see themselves as the, the, the protectors or guardians of the Kemal state. So yeah, yeah that, that's, that's why I also um, spoke about the how international well, those kind of two blocks are that you presented. Uh, uh, obviously, both as uh, within blocks. And my question to Dimo uh, very quickly is: uh, Do you think that the issue of migration is going to be central in the relations with the uh, European Union? The instrumentalization will not continue. Obviously, there are pressures within Turkey as well to do something with the, all those migrants there. The numbers are massive. What do you foresee them over there? I think it will be pretty important, but it won't be the only issue. And also, I think people went too far in suggesting that Erdogan has this trump card that he feels can twist arms in anybody in Brussels or Berlin. And in fact, uh, what happened three years ago, we think recent Turkey suggests that also the EU has the, the means to fight back. Uh, to, to remind people in February of 2020, there was this big influx of uh, migrants plus to, to the Greek border. And of course, the Greek authorities fight back with some help from Frontex uh, and neighboring Bulgaria, which emptied the reservoirs to fill the river. Uh, and it was it was a draw. Nobody could win a win, and everyone couldn't use this, this lever. Uh, but sadly, the migrants were the victims of the situation on both ends. So, but uh, yeah, well, I think there is a whole different agenda as well. It has to do with, um, again, energy, climate. Uh, in 2026, the new uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism will kick in, so Turkey has to adjust because otherwise the exporters will be charging and charge more. EU remains Turkey's uh, most important uh, export market. About 40% of Turkish exports go to the EU. And the X number of other issues. So also probably you will be paying pay some money for reconstruction in Turkey, no Turkey going. So let's say 50% was my and there will be the other 50% other other things. So question for the room. And there are other online people attending as well. So if there are questions coming from them as well, please write them and uh, that's what you tell us, right? Okay, yes. Thank Can you give us your name? Before? Yes, of course. Uh, I'm Carolyn. I'm a DEFL student here at St. Ashton's College, working on gender negotiations in everyday life in Turkey. Um, thank you. This was very interesting. I have two questions I made. Uh, the first one is what, what people refer to as brain draining, which has been a current trend in Turkey. I'd be curious to hear from, from all of you how you think the, the electoral results will the fact that we have even more people ruling the country now, or if you think it will stay on this, this page. And the second question is on the security of the opposition in Turkey. Uh, we have constantly arrests happening, and that's always been the case in Turkish history. Um, but 
many within the opposition were also hoping that a change of government would mean people being able to express their their thoughts not really um, in the future. So I'd be interested in what you think, what will happen to the opposition, maybe not only the key figures, but also people who are just politically engaged in their everyday lives and, and activists, students. Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. And that's had about the thing as well, then we can respond to. Uh, yeah, thank you for three, three really excellent talks, um, in which you gave up a long series of very persuasive reasons for why Erdogan won. And this reminds me of Leszek Karkowski's Law of the Infinite Cornucopia, which states that for anything that happens in history, you can find an almost infinite number of reasons. So if the opposition had won, you would also have structured your talks as a series of reasons why the opposition won. So my question is, how much of it do you think this was structurally the advantages of the system, the party state, an unfair election, and how much fading of the opposition? Is it 80-20, is it 50-50, is it 28 or the other way around? Second question, which we started talking about in the hall, um, we have a whole series of cases now where we have elections that are free but not fair. Mm -hmm. In what way can we, the liberal democracies, distinguish in how we treat the victors of these elections between those who are clearly legitimate victors of entirely free and fair elections and those who are not. So four questions. Um, let's go uh, reverse order. Uh, Dimo, you choose and respond. Yeah, on, on the opposition, maybe I'll take this one. Um, uh, uh, the, the rest and the calm down. Uh, there is a rule book a playbook that has been implemented in the southeast that maybe it's now coming to the big cities as well. I mean, during the local elections, the HDP won overwhelmingly uh, in the Kurdish majority areas. The next thing you knew, they were kind of uh, kicked out and they were uh, government appointed caretakers. I suspect something similar might happen in Istanbul as well. So the elections in Istanbul will be. Uh, uh, carried out by uh, the support. I mean, in, interestingly, the, the interior minister who uh, launched this report and to the prosecutors is uh, that led to yesterday's indictment uh, is the same person who was temporarily the mayor of Istanbul when um, Imam won the, fir the first election that was cancelled and before. The second election, the repeat votes, there was a government caretaker. And that's the same person who is now the interior minister. He was the governor of Istanbul, the, 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 the region of Istanbul at the time. So I think that's something that, that will happen, definitely. But I also agree with them that there is certain resilience about the opposition making the speech to this question. These are real parties, they have real members, they have ideologies as well. Uh, anybody who has been to Turkey knows that all the rallies, people turn up in huge numbers. So Turkey sometimes feels like Europe of yesterday, mass politics, something that is gone now. And, it's, like, and that's why I'm a bit more optimistic about the longer term. Once everyone is gone, uh, those things won't go away. Uh, so the, the resilience, and that will be the basis for recovering some of the impact credentials uh, uh, in Turkey. So structural versus failure of the opposition. Yeah, I, I don't. I think it's again 50 50, it's not 80 20. Um, and Mamu will stood a much better chance, um, uh, ultimately. But who knows? I mean, they're going to probably make things worse within the coalition. So I, I'm not sure I have a big answer to that. The only caveat is that uh, we as analysts tend to have very neat vision holes. This is about fairness, this is about freedom. But it seems to me that the boundary between fair election and unfair election, uh, un unfair election and unfair election is very murky. And this one probably falls into the unfree zone as well. Um, I think I saw a statistic, and correct me if I'm wrong, Tara and Mehmet, in how many polling stations the opposition didn't have observer, especially in rural areas in, in the East and in, in Anatolia. 20,000 something. Yeah, a quite significant number. Now, is that because of the opposition not doing their job and, and sending their representatives or not having enough people on the ground? 
or was it because the state or the party state deliberately made sure that there was nobody to watch those polling stations? But there are some questions about the, the freedom of, of, of voting in those places. Um, a quick answer is, um, I think the brain drain will unfortunately continue. I think um, a general answer is, um, and, and it's, it's, this election was really very, very important. And a lot of people were um, waiting and hoping that the outcome would be different. A lot of people inside the country, mm -hmm. a lot of people outside the country, a lot of governments and a lot of ordinary people. A lot of people couldn't go back to the country, seeing it as a possibility of going back. A lot of people in prison, seeing the establishment of a modicum of rule of law to regain their liberties. And then a lot of youth and not so politicized people who were thinking whether there would be a future for them in the country. And now um, I, I think, at, you know, at least for the presence, um, they won't be very uh, lifted with, with the election results. So unfortunately, I think the brain drain will continue. And what we're already seeing is the evolution, uh, sorry, entrenchment of, um, of new diet for, diet for communities. Um, outside of Turkey, and it reminds me as someone who studies, um, studied Iran, unfortunately, Iranian politicized diasporas who didn't necessarily think they would be gone forever and always thought mm -hmm. they would come back into Cuban diasporas, but ultimately realized in the long run, well, this is it, and their identity being shaped around their opposition. I hope that's not going to be the case, but I think we have a sort of at least a prospect, a, a very scary prospect of that. I also think that you know the, the, the answer to a lot of the questions is continuity. The trajectory that you've seen so far will continue in a, in, a, in, a, in a more intensive way, and that includes the security of the opposition. In particular, on the social level, I'm worried about you know women, LGBTQ plus community in the Kurds, and also those liberal civil rights activists who are you know, trying to defend their ground in Boazici, or our friends were in prison um, because of Gezi. Um, sorry not to be more explicit. Mm -hmm. um, to um, answer the question, if I could, about structure versus you know opposition's own own agency, I don't know how to you know what kind of percentage to give it, but let me just say that within the opposition, I've seen both sort of accounts um, that, and also outside, that it's inevitable that we will win this uh, election because you know, all the cards are stacked against Erdogan, and then after the election, it was inevitable that Erdogan would win. One thing that we know for sure is that Erdogan and his group do not take any of these outcomes for granted. They do not take, you know, they do not rely on any guarantee of winning. They work and they take all the possibilities into consideration. They make plan A, B, C, and D. And when we realize that the opposition doesn't even have a proper plan A, let alone a plan B, then you say, well, okay, you can't blame it on the structure because this this is Can I have to take this on this one? When we say opposition, we exclusively look at the Kurdish rule. But I think one big failure is the conservative uh, spin offs from making, you know, the defectors. So Babajan and the Hutulu, they punch below their weights, and we can discuss why that was the case. But funnily enough, they benefited a lot because with very modest performance, they didn't bring many voters to the, to the battleship. But they in government, they can do horse trading with everyone now. They got what they wanted if you yeah. look from a cynical point of view. Double talk is the big winner. Um, but um, I, it's not just control for sure, but uh, it's a general opposition. Um, and how not to fall for you know this cap of three but unfair elections? Um, I think we also have to update our uh, sort of you know, every time a group of observers go and give the stamp of approval to a seemingly you know free election. Um, on the day of the election, that works as a, a pass for these governments. And they know, and we know now, of course, for you know, more than a decade now, that the manipulation doesn't happen necessarily on the election day. It, by the way, may have happened on the election day as well, yeah. as, as Dimo was saying. So I think there needs to be more focus on the non-election process of democracy um, and, and to raise uh, more issues about, about these. I don't know how to sort of Move it beyond the circles who are already interested in it, but um, that, that the focus on purely election day driven analysis and approvals should be um, we, we 
Mehmet. Yeah, I'll go, go over as well. You know, does that fully agree you know, just with Kara's response regarding the brain drain? Unfortunately, you know, just it will expedite, you know, just it will fasten, it will, you know, just continue. Because, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that these elections had been, you know, just described as the last chance before, you know, just before the exit. And, you know, just a lot of pe people saw it like that. And, it just, and a lot of people you know, just will have already lost their hopes or will have lo will lose their hopes. That's why I can see that the brain drain will continue. Of course, the comparison with Iran is certainly in place. I fully understand that. I hope it's not, not the case. Okay. I share just... I share, you know, the, uh, I share Kara's hope in that sense. Perhaps, you know, just the glimmer of light there is. Turkish diaspora is very much, still, still very much continues to be engaged with Turkish politics. It's easier to go back to the country and just they vote in the elections and they will continue that engagement. Perhaps, uh, hopefully, that's going to be one of the distinguishing features between Turkish diaspora and the Iranian diaspora. In terms of the, you know, policies of the government and, you know, anti democratic policies of the government. I believe, you know, just there is no reason for us to be hopeful and it will get, if anything, it's going to get worse. If if anything, it's going to get worse for two reasons, I believe. The first one is that I believe in the case of the Kurds, the government and their alternations allies, they have reached the conclusion that pressure works, oppression works. I mean, yes, you know, just they have imprisoned uh, Selahattin Demirtas, they have imprisoned countless members of the Kurdish movement, and they will, you know, just look at these results and tell, say say to themselves, look, yes, when we do that, it works, and their share keeps going down, and they will continue that. And not only that, the second reason is, despite everything, you know, Erdogan got a real fear in these elections. He actually you know, just feared that he was going to actually lose or he might actually lose the elections. And it's like you know, just a cat being cornered and he's going to get only more aggressive. And there's no reason really for him you know, just to change course in that regard. And the third reason I said too, but just the third one is, yes, the there was not a burning... I mean, the economic crisis was not of the scale to shift the balances of Turkish politics, but this could have been done only by further delaying it. Turkey borrowed from the Gulf states, Turkey borrowed from Russia, and there will be a more severe economic downturn. That's for sure, because Turkish reserves are empty, and in order to counterbalance that, the new rational economic actors, I'm saying it, quote, unquote, they will have to adopt different policies, and there will be economic repercussions of that, and that will, of course, have its reflection upon societal dynamics and opposition in, in order to counter that, the government will certainly or certainly has the potential to get more authoritarian. Therefore, I'm sorry, I can't be all too hopeful about that. I believe that those anti-democratic policies will uh, will continue and will exacerbate, actually. How much of this is due to structural factors versus failures of the opposition? The structural factors out there, but the fact of the matter is the failures that we have cited, none of it is negligible none of it was negligible yes there are very important structural factors but uh the fact that you know just the opposition came out with the wrong candidate the fact that this had been delayed up until the last moment the fact that this had been done in such a way that it alienated a lot of eve party voters to vote for you know just kemal kalishtorolu the fact that those uh, post akp spin-offs or akp spin-offs you know the defectors they ran for the parliament under the CHP banner. I mean, rather than running you know, just under a different banner or under their own political umbrella. And the fact that the Kurds did not put forward their own candidate in the first round. None of these reasons is negligible. These are really major reasons. And one, you know, just one thing, of course, that is striking is that, I mean, what, what will happen, you know, just if the Kurds do not put forward their candidate, their own candidate? What will happen just if the, you know, just defectors, AKP defectors, spin-offs, you know, just run for the parliament under CHP? These are two major questions. And did the table of six run any proper, you know, just poll or analysis or a real, you know, just in-depth research on it before taking these two key decisions? 
I mean, as someone who has been involved in one way or another with those processes, I can tell you that those decisions were not necessarily based on in-depth studies, despite the fact that those questions were, were well known to all those people for quite some time. Therefore, I believe, yes, the structural reasons are there, but had the opposition alliance done some of these things right, I'm not saying all of them right, but some of these things right, the outcome could actually have been different. And this free and fair, I, I really just agree with Dimitar. I mean, we should stop, you know, just calling these elections free. I mean, we all have a consensus view that they, those, they were unfair, but how can we call elections free while, while for instance, Demirtas could not properly run for these elections? Even if he had wanted to become a candidate, I mean, it would have been very difficult. Imam Olu couldn't properly run for the elections because he had that court award out there. And especially for the Kurdish party, thousands of their supporters, despite they had nothing had to do with violence, are still in prison simply because they simply saw that you know, just they can't you know, just continue their grassroots politics in the region simply so that they can't you know, just observe the elections you know, just in the region. I mean, these are all factors that should not simply go into the unfairness box. These are factors that should go, that should count towards the unfree, you know, just account as well, unfree box as well. And, you know, just election observers. OK, I mean, it's certainly good to have them rather than not having them at all. But we should really seriously consider the focus of those reports. I mean, we cannot simply ignore the fact that the election is not a simply one day event. I'm not saying that they are doing it. I mean, they tend they are trying to make their reports slightly more comprehensive. But at the end of the day, these are all diplomatic reports. They do not want to alienate you know, just home country politicians too much so that they can continue their access. And I believe there is a need for an honest conversation for those people to decide whether they should continue this line of work and give actually tools of legitimacy into those authoritarian leaders' hands to, for them to say that, oh, look, we've got you know just proper elections. I think you've got a very fair point there, um, uh, Mehmet, uh, in the sense that uh, Erdogan keeps on talking about the Turkish democracy, but what he means exactly is the actual act of the elections and the fact that uh, 85 or 87% of Turks go and vote, that doesn't make them necessarily, of course, free elections. Otto, Otto, I have to say one more thing, and which is, I'm sorry for that. There is a huge dilemma for opposition in such regimes, not only in Turkey. On the one hand, you know, just the, I mean, the cards are stacked against them. The playing field is certainly not level. They know it, they know about this and they want to fight against that and they want to expose this. But on the other end, there's only so many things that you can say about this because if you keep moaning and complaining about this, especially in the lead up to elections, you would demotivate your voters. You would demotivate your base because then you start instilling into them the, you know, the idea that this is fate, we can't get rid of that. This, the, uh, the, I mean, it is irreversible. It is inevitable. Therefore, I think in that sense, yes, we have to give credit to the opposition because quite a few people now criticize the opposition by saying that, oh, why did not they talk about this and that unfairness factors before the elections? It's not that they didn't know about this, but this is a dilemma that they are in. On the one hand, they have to motivate their base. They have to you know, just permeate the idea that the change is possible. And in order to do that, they they find themselves in a position where they can't underline too much the unfairness. I mean, they have to give the message that regardless how unfair it is, we can win. Okay, I've got uh, two online questions, uh, but let me, let's uh, 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 copy uh, uh, for me. And then we've got another a couple from here. Now, let me read it because uh, it is a little long, but... Uh, in the domain of political campaigning, it is evident that uh, the AKB in Turkey allocated considerably higher resources towards uh, advertising, especially on the widely utilized platform of Facebook in Turkey. However, 
concerns have been raised regarding the presence of disinformation within these ads. This prompts a significant question did the AKP's um, employment of a disinformation campaign yield substantial influence? Some researchers posit that the AKP's campaign primarily aimed to solidify support among its existing voter base rather than actively seeking um, to swing voters from rival parties. I was wondering your opinion regarding this issue. This comes from Bashar. And we've got one from Emma as well. Um, increasingly over the past few years, and uh, most dramatically in the final weeks of the election, there has been widely expressed uh, intense anti-refugee sentiment in Turkey, in particular among opposition supporters. Do you foresee this issue sub subsiding from headlines now that the election has passed? Do you think the opposition, um, the opposition will increase the intensity of the anti-refugee back backlash among opposition supporters? Uh, and uh, David. Oh, thank you. David, um, thank you for a really excellent presentation. Deeply depressing, but thank you for heroic attempts to look for political lines. Um, logically, now that he's won his election, um, Erdogan should be um, seeking to um, solve the Sweden NATO problem and allow Sweden in. Is that in any way a reflection of how he might see the situation? Um, a slightly different question with, from the same perspective. Do you think that now he's won the election and you know, Turkey is looking into a big country, um, it's you know, economy, well, despite Erdogan, it's still a big economy. Um, do you think there's a, a danger that some governments in the West, e.g. US or the UK, might say, well, let's cut him so some, some slack. There's a certain stability there. He's won the election. Let's see what happens. Thank you. Uh, is there any other person in the room? Please pick up because we've got the microphone so that yes. Mehmet and the others can hear as well. Yes. I have a, a brief question, if I may. I wrote to Ellie from St. Anthony's College. So we always used to say who controls Istanbul controls Turkey. Right? This used to be what people used to say in relation to the municipal election, in relation to everything. Really. And I guess my question is other than means of gaining legitimacy, how important really are the municipal elections going to be in March? I mean, we come back to them quite a lot in the discussions, uh, but we've seen, for example, over the course of the last couple of years, I mean, Istanbul municipalities have been banned from raising uh, euro bonds. Um, there's a, a study by my organization, EGRD, that's found that state bank lending towards opposition controlled uh, municipalities is, is uh, retracted in periods running up to elections and so on. So in reality, other than a way of gaining legitimacy, how important is it to win the elections? Thank you. And yes. Uh, my name is Marianne. I'm a guest from Germany. My husband comes originally from Turkey. And my question is, um, now I feel a uh, uh, disaster deeper and deeper. And what do you expect will change worse in the education sector? Thank you very much. Okay, should we all try to answer all the questions? No, you have to take the choice. I should be anonymous just in case I give Mr. Rogan mm -hmm. any wrong ideas. Basically, from the top of strong years of choice. I'll keep it very, very, very brief. Uh, presumptuous question. Do you think it's inevitable and can be prevented in war between two NATO allies? Inevitable and can we prevent the war between between Turkey and Greece? But we don't name countries. Yeah. We leave it alone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's start with Mehmet this time and we'll finish with that demo. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Uh, there are lots of questions. Um, sorry, I mean, let, let me start with the Facebook thing. Yes, you know, just AKP has used, you know, just social media and that type of campaigning, you know, just very much as well. And in the very first place, they use that, you know, just to spread, you know, just misinformation. That's for sure. They use, you know, deep fakes, you know, just, uh, you know, just they wanted to give the message that the opposition is supported by the PKK. And the fact of the matter is, I mean, there is a very interesting study by two Turkish 
and one journalist, you know, just the other one is a scholar that shows that despite the fact that those videos were tagged as misinformation by the relevant NGOs, Google, Facebook kept recommending them in 82% of the cases. I mean, one fact of the matter is, I mean, of course, the attitude or the behavior of Google, Facebook, that those type of companies are very much under the limelight when it comes to elections in the West. But when it comes to elections in the countries like Turkey, nobody cares that much for as long as you pay the right price. And the government has deep pockets. They paid the right price and they had all the means to spread misinformation. Of course, we do not care much about this because it is the Orient and they do not deserve democracy anyway. But it's something you know just important that we have to underline. I mean, Facebook and you know just Google and the likes, they actually they did actually play an important role in this issue. And there, what was the second online question? Because the online question sort of disappeared. Okay about the uh, refugees, whether this is talking about oh, the refugee, refugee issue, was... it will persist, it will remain in, on top of Turkish political agenda, it will, you know, just remain there. And the opposition will most probably continue this attitude. And because it's a hotly contested issue in Turkey, and frankly, I mean, one point there is, it is perhaps one issue that cuts across the political spectrum, that in one way or another, unites a lot of people. And, and the Kurds are not an exception in that regard, Dimo. I mean, I don't think that in the runoff, in the runoff, there has been a slight decrease in the Kurdish participation uh, for in the presidential election. But I do not think it is because of the, you know, stance against the refugees or stance against the Syrians in Turkey. It was mainly because the support of Umut Özda and Umut Özda is such a fascist figure that it is a symbol in the eyes of the Kurds. And therefore, it might have played a role in the decrease of their participation, but not necessarily the message of you know returning to Syrians because it is a message that cuts across the political spectrum and it will get if anything even worse because we know that you know just there there are quite a few newly naturalized Middle Eastern voters some of them you know just did purchase that citizenship by buying a house in Turkey. It used to be a house that was at least worth 250,000 euros. Now it is 400,000 euros. Once you do that, you can get citizenship not only for yourself, for your entire family. That means you are entitled to vote. There are government figures that say that only something like 300,000 voters had purchased citizenship through such means. But of course, there is the inherent unreliability of figures in the case of Turkey. And therefore, I mean, if anything, I mean, this opposition towards, you know, Syrians, Afghans, you name it. I mean, people who need temporary protection in Turkey, it's going to get worse because, I mean, that's going to be one of the main arguments of the opposition. We do not know. I mean, there is a difference of two million votes between Erdogan and Kılıçdaroğlu. And we do not exactly know how much of it is due to newly naturalized voters and this will continue in the political debate and last question that i will answer i mean i will leave the others you know just to kara and uh demo for sure the importance of the municipal elections is that it's not of course only the legitimacy but it is the municipal the municipalities they are the bastion they are the pillar of the clientelist system that erdogan has I mean, what, there's a key difference between Turkey and Russia, Turkey and uh, Turkey and Iran. What is that? We don't have natural resources. Turkey doesn't have the black curse. As I mean, if Turkey had the black curse, if the, if Turkey had <laughs> natural resources, most probably we would have been in the same place as Russia right now with Erdogan collecting 78% of the vote easily. But Turkey needs to continue to generate economic value so that the government could continue to sponsor its clientelist regime. And that economic value, to a large extent, has been created through urban rent. And the rent is much higher in, in, in urban areas. And to the extent that the opposition continues to control the main urban centers, it may not perhaps create urban rent for its own supporters, but it can at the very least prevent the government creating the same rent.
That's why from that very clientelistic utilitarian clientelist point, it is very important for the opposition to continue to control the municipalities. Thank you, Memo. Uh, Carla, what was the middle? Okay. Um, I'll um, pick up on the questions that uh, Mehmet didn't um, touch upon. Uh, David's question about um, uh, resolution, I think, and, and whether but on the, on, in the, on the Western side, there will be a sort of um, accommodationist approach to that one. I think, I think yes, this will be the case, um, so, which also links up to Timothy's question of what do these elections end up doing? They end up, when they're lost, in, inadvertently or not legitimizing, um, and perhaps you know, from a democratic perspective, very illegitimate uh, you know, governments. And, a lot of governments on, in the West were on the fence, waiting for the election outcomes. Now they're convinced Erdogan is here to stay. He is the man to do business with. You know, uh, Stoltenberg was in the inauguration. Lincoln has been on the, the phone with Erdogan. So you know, put aside all the other issues. Let's let's get the business and let's solve the Swedish issue. Um, we also mentioned the devil that we know. Perhaps I feel okay. The elections are passed. This is what we have to deal with. And I think this is. Um, this will be costly from the perspective of, you know, of the opposition and losing the limelight and, and, and being able to showcase all these uh, dark side of the Turkish government. Um, the municipality question that Mehmet answered. In terms of the education sector, um, another unfortunately pessimistic take, uh, but for so as someone who is from Turkey um, and um, never really thought of cutting his ties with Turkey and was also a father of a four year old. Um, one of my main concerns is personally, once I have my life set up, I don't, I didn't mind going back to Turkey and losing a lot of it to, to struggle, but I always thought, how would I put my, what kind of an education system would I put my daughter in? And this is, this is the preoccupation of a lot of people, the, 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 the uh, concern of a lot of people. Three things are going to happen. Um, Public institution, public education system, high school, middle schools will be more and more Islamicized. This is what the government will give, especially to its uh, coalition partners. It won't let uh, the, these more conservative um, uh, alliances dictate foreign policy, for instance, but on social issues, cultural issues, they'll have influence and that will impact, for instance, uh, curricula. Um, but second also aspect is the economic meltdown in Turkey and how it's uh, making education, uh, you know, private education, prohibitively ex expensive for only the very you know, smallest top 1% uh, of the population. So the education, private education is becoming very expensive, quality is um, falling down, and then universities becoming, you know, the few universities that had um, institutional autonomy facing Losing that autonomy was the Boston University uh, to start with, which means that what families are concerned with now, those who can manage, are trying to send their kids abroad as quickly as possible. So that goes back to the brain drain question. Um, I think I'll stop that. I, I just to say that I personally don't think there's going to be a Greece Turkey war. I don't think it's inevitable at all. Um, but uh, maybe Dimo wants to. <laughs> I, I see that more of a, you know, I don't mean to say that this was an all election grandstanding. The election grandstanding, and uh, you never you have to take Adam seriously when he threatens something or when he says he's going to do something. But in this case, um, I think he's gained what he wants to gain out of the confrontation. Uh, I don't think there's it's not going to be you know rough for run, but um, I don't see the tensions going high up in the, in the short to medium term, uh, for, at least for now. So my five lira worth of very simple analysis is got uh, it's worth nothing five lira. Yeah, I know. <laughs> five, 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 and by the time I finish, it might be a little less worth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I absolutely agree with the men that the municipalities are a big rent making generating machines, and of course, all legislation is restrictive, but the ATP controls together with the MHP Parliament, so they can change the law. But I think there is also the danger that if the opposition 
stays in power in municipalities. It can be co-opted as well, because uh, you have a JHP uh, CHP nomenclatura as well, and they could become a stakeholder in the regime. In other words, you don't have a chance to win power nationally. You're given a piece of the pie, you run a couple of cities, uh, and you become uh, tacitly complicit in, in running, running the system. If Erdogan was smart, I don't think he'll play this game. I, I, I think he wants Istanbul. But I think the smart thing would have been to maybe leave Istanbul to, to the opposition. Uh, the current status quo is not super, but there's some upsides for, for the government as well. But that's just my speculation on municipalities. Uh, on Sweden, Sweden can play both ways because yesterday or today, but there was a statement by Erdogan saying that Sweden hasn't done anything. Or that hasn't done enough, so we want more. He obviously linked it to Shimshek. I'm giving more economic power, but I've called the fourth on, on Sweden. And this can go forever. Uh, I think the cost of Sweden being outside NATO is not as high because you can have no workarounds with what Ukraine is now doing. And there might be a bilateral treaty with the US and the UK. And there will be force of cooperation. Sweden has defense capacity. And frankly, I don't think Sweden faces a Russian attack um, re realistically. So they probably reached the point where they've given enough to, to Erdogan and maybe not give more. But he can decide more of something else. Right now, it seems that the smart money is that there will be a compromise. Maybe not in unions, but afterwards. On cutting some slack to Erdogan. Absolutely, it was very visible when the EU Council discussed sanctions against Turkey uh, on this. So you had a clear division on the one hand, you had Greece, Cyprus, and France, that probably speaks to your question, the city. And if there is a conversation in the Aegean, first of all, Greece is not inconsequential, that's quite a bit of defense capacity, and there's France as well. Uh, and as we know from Ukraine, wars are certain. They're not linear. They don't give you all the all the, the perks. They can go in all kinds of directions. But when the discussion happened, there was this division. France said, let's go hard on Erdogan and all those people who are drilling oil and gas in Cypriot waters. And then there was Germany saying, look, we don't need to burn bridges to the Turks because we have X number of overlapping issues. And actually, in this debate, many Eastern Europeans are with, with Germany. And the likes of Poland, uh, Hungary, obviously, with Orban, also Bulgaria would be definitely. I mean, the, our, our president was there for the inauguration, and there, there won't be any time a government in Sofia which won't be uh, looking for a friendly relationship with, with the Turks. So I don't see any robust policy uh, at the EU. It's bound to be 50 50 with people saying, no, let's uh, show them. Uh, but, uh, so some punches, but they'll be moderating uh, forces saying, oh, let's not um, go too far with sanctions. Thank you very much, Timo. And uh, I'm sure you agree with me that that was terrific. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I your, um, uh, your presentations and your responses were um, very, very interesting. You, you know the topic. And uh, of course, we don't see anything radical. We go with the devil we know. Uh, and uh, we would have many, many chances to continue discussing uh, this. Um, so I would like to ask you to um, uh, uh, to give a round of applause for our speakers. But before that, I would like to thank uh, Ladislav because he's been with us two years. He's been um, uh, managing the hybrid system, writing the blogs, and he's been a terrific uh, help for us. He's an MP student in here. Thank you very much, Ladislav. For the adults for organizing this, and of course, uh, Dimo, Kara, and Memo. Enjoy the drinks. Memo. <laughs> I, mean, I wouldn't complain much. I'm in Paris. I will enjoy some good wine. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> you were in Norway yesterday. Now you're in Paris. Exactly. I mean, yesterday, Norway. Today, Paris. Tomorrow, I'm in Oxford. See you all right. there. See you there. Uh, okay. Well, thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.